What's the fundamental rule of real estate? Even if you don't know the first thing about it, you've probably heard the answer. Location, location, location. Well, I'm here to tell you tonight that that rule is broken and has been for some time. How do I know? Because we're designing something called driverless cars. And in much the same way the automobile shaped cities of the 20th century, it's going to change our cities again. And it's going to change everything that we thought we knew about real estate. It's no news that we're in an era of disruption. The world's second largest hotel chain, Airbnb, doesn't own any beds, doesn't own any property. The world's largest taxi company, Uber, doesn't own their cars. So we're changing what it means to travel, we're changing what it means to own something, and we're changing what it means to commute. These shifts are going to be accelerated by the driverless car. Because if we're building cars that don't have drivers, we can design buildings with no parking. And if we can design buildings that don't need parking, we're going to design cities that look unlike anything we've seen for the last 100 years. In a way, this is the story of how cars have changed cities twice over. To understand how, we're going to look at how they did it the first time. To understand when driverless cars will change cities, we're going to look at autonomous tech. And maybe we'll take a look at just how our lives will change and every building in it in the coming real estate revolution. So let's take a trip back. It's 1900. The Model D hasn't even been invented yet. There are less than 8,000 cars in the US. Just a decade later, there are nearly half a million. How did that happen? Wow. People could go further, faster, for less money. The economy was booming. But it brought some bad things, too. Congestion, traffic, fatality, energy dependency, and everybody's favorite, parking. By 1926, downtown merchants had listed traffic congestion as their main business concern. People hated parking even back in 1926. So cities came in, they said, OK, we're going to put parking meters on the street, and we're going to move cars off the road, and we're going to put them in garages. We're going to help ease the traffic and increase road capacity. Sounds great. Second wave of automobile innovation hit the United States after World War II. We built something called the Interstate Highway System. We connected every major city in the US, and we made there and here simultaneously closer together and much further apart. Our city planning approach during this period of time is basically separate all the buildings and all the uses, build giant roads to get there, and give everybody a parking space when they arrive. No problem. It's called sprawl, and we can see it from space. This is aerial imagery of Las Vegas. You can see just how quickly we consume the landscape. We consume land faster than the population grows, 40% faster. This massive use of space is driven by our appetite for automobiles because they take a lot of room, not only on the roads, but in our buildings, in our garages, in our houses, in our businesses. Now it's not uncommon in any city in America for parking to be bigger than the size of the building itself. This is where parking begins to dominate real estate. We have four parking spaces for every car in the US. Imagine if every family had four houses. Now, granted, parking stalls are not as expensive as houses, but even at a modest cost, it's trillions of dollars that are locked up as empty storage. That's the size of Maine, two billion parking stalls. So a century after the release of the Model T, we have more than one car for every driver in the US. It's a huge part of our lives, but it's a small part of our economy. It's only 3%. So how is it that something so small has been able to drive development decisions for the last century. It's because that rule is flawed. Real estate's not about location. It's about transportation. It's about how you get there. And that's how small changes in the automobile industry can mean huge things for real estate. And let me be clear, the autonomous car is no small change. The pace of technology and investment in this sector has sped up rapidly in the past few years. This is a picture of LiDAR. This is a laser scanning image that kind of allows a car to see, if you will. This technology has been reduced by 90% just in the last three years. 
combine this really cool advanced imagery with deep learning algorithms and we can both teach a car to see and teach it how to drive. Autonomous vehicles are not just possible, they're imminent. Without changing a single federal law in the US, autonomous cars have driven three million miles. Now that's just in testing mode. But there are other modes already on the consumer market that do some pretty incredible stuff. Tesla's autopilot mode can take you on the freeway on-ramp, change lanes, and even take you home and park in your garage for you. But there are 40 different makes and models of cars out there that can parallel park themselves. But what if they could do more? Imagine you're on your way to work, you're already running a little late, it's raining, you hop out of the car in a hurry, and your car has dropped you off at the newly designed, covered drop-off spot for your building. It's where the parking meters used to be. You get out, you send your car away, it scurries off to go find a parking space, and you type in the amount that you want to pay for that parking on your phone. You're already in the elevator, and your car tells you, found a spot for eight bucks. All right, sure. Your car scurries away, finds that parking space, and slips into it with just inches to spare on either side. It doesn't need space for the doors to open for anyone to get out. And you continue working. Your car waits for you to summon it at the end of the day. Or maybe you send your car to work. Maybe you hop on a different app on your phone, and you send your car to go out there in the city and help other people who don't own cars get around. This virtual valet system seems pretty futuristic, but we already have the technology. It's here in your pockets. And these 44 corporations have invested billions of dollars in autonomous tech, and it's coming quickly. 11 major auto manufacturers have promised fully autonomous vehicles by 2020. That's in three years. Our cities are ready for a revolution. The cities of the last century were designed around cars, so it makes sense that if the cars change dramatically, so do our places. And because the real estate industry is so much bigger than the automobile industry, we're going to see massive changes. And I would say that these are going to be categorized in roughly three different ways. The first is that the average American household spends $9,000 a year on automobiles. Driverless cars can reduce that by $5,600. That's the equivalent of a 10% raise. And who doesn't want that? <laughs> Just kidding. Put it in your hands. And so if we use those savings, what else can we do with it? Could we finally own that home? Could we do away with maybe garages? Could we move our homes a little bit closer to the street because we don't need garages or driveways? If you do have a home with a garage, we can use that extra 500 square feet of space for something different. We can use that room and we can design a prefabricated housing container that slides into the space where your cars used to be and clicks into the existing grid. You have housing for grandma or a grad student. You have space to open that home business that you've always been wanting. You have room for your family to grow. We can help solve the housing crisis in areas like San Francisco with a system like this. The average income can only buy you about 135 square feet in San Francisco. That's the size of a parking stall. So we can finally afford the home of our dreams. And maybe that's a little bit further from work, but that's okay because we're productive on the way there. Maybe we can sleep on our way to work, not at work. Maybe we can work on the way home. It's no longer leave the office, stop working, and go home. You work as you go home. And maybe the windows are screens and the wheel is a desk. This is pretty productive time. Total miles driven might actually increase if people can afford and maybe even enjoy their commute. We can reduce the cost to commute by 70%, making maybe a 200-mile-long travel time to work, possible. Companies can then tap into large labor markets, and they can open a new business location anywhere. Now, the third paradox of driverless cars is that they do both good things and both some undetermined things. They could push development further out from cities, or we could just use the space we have more efficiently. Electric vehicles can mean that, although our commutes are longer, maybe we have less emissions. Maybe two car households can downsize to one, and mobility can increase for everyone. So we're seeing these massive changes at the economy scale, but it also makes a really big difference at the household scale. And I think we can make three key changes today to usher in the age of the autonomous vehicle. The first is just to spend more wisely. 
because autonomous vehicles are hitting the market faster than your car loan will mature. This car is going to be your last. We can use those savings that we experience from transportation and we can offer up new housing opportunities. Maybe millennials can finally move out of their parents' basements. Yes. <laughs> the driverless car can increase mobility and access for all ages. We can even get more from our garages as housing, our parking lots into parks, or our driveways as patios. I know this seems a little futuristic, but I hope you understand now that the autonomous revolution is not about robots. It's about people and places and property value. And I want you to imagine what that looks like for the people in your life, because I know I can imagine how it could change the lives of people that I hold dear. My 13-year-old niece never has to learn how to drive. My 93-year-old grandma, who's still driving herself, can continue to be mobile for many, many years. And a dear friend of mine, who couldn't make it here tonight, not because he doesn't have a car. His car is big enough to accommodate his wheelchair. He didn't have anybody to drive him here. And I look forward to the day when he doesn't need anybody. When our cities can become more inclusive, more mobile, we, we can free people from location, and here becomes there, and there can become everywhere. Location, the fundamental rule of real estate, is broken because location is ubiquitous with the lift of a thumb. And I hope you're not scared about driverless cars because I think they can really increase the quality of life and they can shape our cities for the better. They have the opportunity to reorganize budgets, reclaim space, and redefine mobility. If we seize this opportunity now, we can make the cities of the future more livable for everyone, and we can get there faster without having to worry about, are we there yet? Thank you.